Good evening, my name is Karen Mays and I am president of the uh, Manhattan Riley County League of Women Voters. And it's my great privilege to um, welcome you this evening to Safeguarding U.S. Democracy, a quest for more diverse judiciary. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League continues to work to promote the importance of fair and impartial courts nationwide. From 2009 to 2011, the League has committed to focus on promoting diversity at all levels of the state judiciary to enhance the legitimacy of our system of justice in the eyes of an increasingly diverse public. A continuation of the status quo will affect the way citizens look at the role courts play in their communities. It erodes the trust on the courts, questions the right of equal, equal under the law, and courts may not be perce perceived to be fair and impartial. Please also join me this evening in thanking our co-sponsors for this forum. Our, sponsor, our co-sponsors are the Dorothy L. Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series, the K-State Student Union Program Council, K-State Affirmative Action, Diversity and Dual Career Development, the Institute for Civil Discourse and Democracy, Multi Multicultural Programs and Services, the Pre-Law Program, the Riley County Bar Association, and UFM. And now it is my great privilege to introduce April Mason, Provost and Senior Vice President of Kansas State University. Well, I want to welcome you on behalf of Kansas State University. It's uh, very nice to have you all here, and I bet you are like me. You're looking forward to both our guest speaker this evening and the panelists that will follow that. Um, this is uh, my first opportunity to be a part of this event, and I want to sincerely thank the League of Women Voters, Manhattan, Riley County, for bringing this important program to Kansas State University. Um, thank you to our distinguished keynote speaker and our panelists that have come out this evening. A little louder. Thank you. I also want to uh, say a special thanks to the Dorothy Thompson Lecture Series patrons and sponsors for their support of this event. Um, it's uh, particularly touching, I'll be telling you a little bit about the background of that, uh, that we honor uh, Dorothy Thompson um, and uh, have this event in, on her behalf this evening. Uh, it's truly an honor to have a Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court and three members of the Kansas Court of Appeals as part of our Constitution Week programming. Uh, very importantly, uh, thank you all for coming out on a very questionable evening. I just received a text from the Wichita area uh, where there was a tornado coming and uh, we have had some real questionable weather all day and I think you're very brave to be out this evening, so thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about the lecture series and about uh, Dorothy Thompson. This series was established in recognition of Dorothy L. Thompson's contribution to the field of civil rights on campuses throughout the state of Kansas and uh, the country. Dorothy Thompson was the university's first director of affirmative action, and later she was an associate university attorney. Dorothy's tenure with the university spanned three decades, from 1971 until her very untimely death in 1992. This lecture to honor her as a memorial was set up in 1994. Dorothy was truly a role model for women and for attorneys in Kansas. She was highly regarded by persons of all political uh, persuasions for her diplomacy, her judiciousness, and her effectiveness. And I think those are three wonderful attributes uh, to have for a person. Dorothy had an abiding respect for all people and a profound commitment to fairness and equity, 
a civil rights lecture series is a particularly fitting memorial for her. Tonight's program is the 33rd lecture in this series, and I'm very happy to be here for my first. Before I conclude, I'm very happy to announce that not only do we have this opportunity this evening, uh, but we have a number of things scheduled for tomorrow. I'd like to invite you all to experience firsthand oral arguments in four real-life cases that our three judges of the Courts, Court of Appeals have, uh, here tonight will hear in this very um, auditorium forum, forum hall tomorrow. You'll see how real cases are presented to the Court of Appeals. Um, and it will be a come and go as your schedule allows because I see many students in our audience this evening and they, you must juggle the classes that you're taking as well. Uh, the first two cases will be heard between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m. and the second two cases will be heard from 1.05 until 2.05 p.m. Please join me in welcoming our 33rd Dorothy L. Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series program participants this evening. Thank you. Thank you, April. I do want to just make a little housekeeping announcement. We want to invite you to ask questions of our panelists this evening and also our keynote speaker. You were probably given or handed a note card that you can write your questions on. We do have room monitors in the room. They've been handing out programs and are available. Just hold your card up. They'll come by and pick those up, and that way we can forward questions up to the um, people on the panel. And now um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Marla J. Lukert, a justice on the Kansas Supreme Court. Thank you. It truly is my honor to be here tonight. Um, Dorothy Thompson was someone I considered a friend, and someone I looked up to, someone who aided me, and someone who stood as a role model to me. And those are themes that I'll come back to as we talk tonight about what I have been asked to address, which is, does the Kansas judicial system reflect the diversity in, of our state? And if not, does that matter? The answer to the first question is no. The Kansas judiciary does not reflect the diversity of our state. The answer to the second question is yes. It, is an, it matters a great deal that we do not reflect that diversity. Let me tell a story that I know some of you in the audience have heard before of an anecdote that brings, brought home to me very clearly why that diversity does matter to at least some. And this is a, a situation that happened within days of my taking the bench as a trial judge, a district court trial judge, and I see that we have other trial judges in the audience, so don't, we can contrast our experiences. This was at a point, seriously, I had only been there for days and was probably more nervous than even the defendant in the courtroom. And I, the, we call court to order, we go in, and I, my understanding is I'm going to be calling a criminal case to conduct a criminal court trial. We call the case, and suddenly the defense counsel, after having made an appearance, says, Judge, may I approach the bench? That was a little early, but we do that, and the counsel says, Judge, could we recess? My client is insistent he has something he has to talk to me and that it's very urgent. Well, I kind of hated to delay all of this. You know, I was, I was there, I was ready to go, but we did it. And he, then I get word back through chambers uh, that we're not going to do a trial, we're going to go in and we're going to take a plea on this case. So we all usher back into the courtroom, I call the case again, we go through the colloquy of taking a plea, which is where someone, rather than going through the trial, can admit their guilt or at least admit that the state has enough evidence to find them guilty and they're willing to waive their right to a trial. As they get to the factual basis, which they have to present to me that the state had facts that they could 
have found that, that I, as a fact finder, could have found this person guilty of the crime, the light starts to go on because of the nature of the facts that are being presented to me. But of course, nobody says the reason we're entering a plea is because of this. We adjourn, I take the plea, we adjourn court, I go back into my chambers, and I receive yet another message from counsel. The, the state and the defendant's attorney want to speak to me because they wanted to explain what had happened. And what had happened was that this defendant had been urgent, very strong in his commitment to have a trial until he walked in the courtroom. And then he tugged on his attorney's uh, suit coat and said, you didn't tell me it was a woman. <laughs> and the fact that I was a woman sitting on that bench changed his mind that he wanted to not roll the dice and have a determination of whether I would find him guilty or not guilty. Now you're probably sitting there thinking you might have a guess as to what kind of case it was. Any thoughts? Anybody want to throw something out? Judge Roth? Well, Judge it was a purse snatching. <laughs> this guy apparently was a serial purse snatcher, and he would go into restaurants or bars or other places, and when women would have their purses over the back of their chair or under their chair or all the places we as women leave, I don't even know where mine is right now. Um, and he would, he would grab those and snatch and run. And apparently he thought that a male judge was gonna be quite sympathetic to his little crime uh, way of life, but he recognized immediately that since I carried a purse, on a, he assumed I did, at least on a routine basis, that I would be less than sympathetic to what he had to say. So, it, as I said, within days of my taking the bench, it was apparent to me that my gender was going to make a difference to at least some people who came into my courtroom. A few days later, I started my first jury trial. That jury trial um, happened to be a case in which the defendant was black, and he was represented by a black attorney. This black attorney is now on the Shawnee County District Court bench, but at that time he was trying many criminal cases. And he stood up during the selection of the jury process and he said to the jury, which happened to be entirely white, I want you to imagine with me that you were in Harlem and you are arrested for a crime while you were in Harlem. You were put in the jail. You were brought into a courtroom. When you walk into that courtroom, you see an entire black jury, a black judge, black attorneys, how do you feel? What's going through your mind? Are you confident that you will have a fair and impartial jury trial? He would then challenge the jurors to think about that and to reverse those roles and to make a commitment that they would be able to set aside any biases they might have, any prejudices they might have, so that they would indeed guarantee that they could be fair and impartial to this, this defendant who was accused of a crime. No one suggested that they couldn't be or that they wouldn't be. I think what he was trying to relay to the jury, is the potential jurors, is to imagine the concern and the fear of someone who felt that isolated, that they were unlike everyone in their surrounding and in a situation where the stakes were very high. Again, bringing home the idea that there is at least a perception that diversity can make a difference. There is statistical evidence, that's my cell phone, I apologize if it's being picked up by the sound system, I forgot to turn it off. Um, there is statistical evidence that kind of supports this phenomena, if you will. And that was done in the state of New York, where they did a survey. And they, in part of the survey, they did ask um, diversity questions. But the question ultimately was, do you believe the judiciary is fair and impartial? For those who reported themselves to be Caucasian, 71% of them reported 
that they felt the judiciary was fair and impartial. Minorities, that factor dropped by over 20 percentage points when my mem minority members answered the same question. I think we have to say that as people look at the bench, as they look at the judiciary, diversity makes a difference. The reasons that we would say that are varied. Um, there is a lot of scholarly analysis of, does it really change the outcome of a trial? Does it change a decision when these three appellate judges are sitting there? Will it make a difference that they are, that they are the makeup that they are? Most of the scholarly evidence shows that really there is not a difference in outcome, except perhaps in a small, uh, very narrow area of cases of sex discrimination cases. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a, a little bit. But I think everybody from all sides, whether they're scholars, they're bar members, they're judges, they're members of the public, whether they're centrist politicians or politicians on the, on the fringes of either side, say, our judiciary needs to reflect our population in order for people to trust it and to be committed to the concept of the rule of law and having the judiciary be at the focus of that rule of law. Former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, as many of you may know, is, and, and actually Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, are both very ardent that they should not have preference because they are women. And let me tell you a few things that they have said that kind of bring this to home. In 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor, in answering questions about her gender and her role on a court, potentially, would said, yes, I will bring the understanding of a woman to the court, but I doubt that that will affect my decisions. I think the important thing about my appointment is not that I will decide cases as a woman, but that I am a woman and I will decide cases. After her career in writing her book in The Majesty of the Law, O'Connor summed up this again and said, the power I exert on the court depends on the power of my arguments, not on my gender. J Justice Ginsburg, who has a long history of being an opponent of special treatment of minorities or women, or, and a disbeliever in what is often known as the so-called difference theory, um, and, and for those of you that may not have a background in feminist theory, the, the difference theory really builds on the, the scholarly work of a communication uh, scholar, Carol Gilligan. And the, um, much of that principle is that there is an ethic of caring that women bring to the branch or to the professions or to their role in life. And in a 2009 interview, Justice Ginsburg expressed skepticism of that. And she said, I certainly know that there are women in federal courts with whom I disagree just as strongly as I disagree with any man. I guess I have some resistance to that kind of survey because it's like what I was arguing against in the 1970s. But interestingly, in the same interview, she went on to talk about a case Safford versus Redding, which dealt with the strip search of a 13-year-old girl by school authorities. The, the suspicion was that this young woman had ibuprofen, and that was an illicit substance in the school. After uh, the question was brought to the US Supreme Court as to whether or not it was appropriate for a strip search to be done in this way, and she, this is what Justice Ginsburg said about her role in that decision. I think it makes people stop and think. Maybe a 13-year-old girl is different from a 13-year-old boy in terms of how humiliating it is to be seen undressed. She talked about the fact that many of her male colleagues on the bench during the oral argument kept asking questions about, well, what? You have to undress for sports. You have to undress for PE. We're used to locker rooms, it's not a big deal. And her take on it was, I think many of the male justices first thought of their own reaction. 
It came out in the various questions. It's different. I convinced them it's different for a 13-year-old girl. So she obviously feels some tension about whether or not her gender does have an ethic of caring, perhaps not, but it does bring something that changes the role or the view. As I indicated briefly earlier, there has been some scholarly study that shows that the one area of law where statistically there may have been a difference in the fact of outcomes when there are women judges presiding or women on a panel, and these were appellate courts that were being studied. So this would be one woman in a group of three judges reviewing a case or perhaps more judges. And that there was more often an outcome in favor of the plaintiff, the woman who was bringing these sex discrimination cases. But it's interesting that the research did not necessarily show that the women themselves had a higher uh, chance of voting in favor of that plaintiff, but that the group did. And this, the discussion, the debate, is whether just having the woman there in some way changed the, the attitude, the thought process. Perhaps it was a peer review, a peer pressure type of thing of, I have this female colleague sitting next to me, I can't express a thought that I might have in another way. It's very preliminary research, much is left to be done, um, but the general, even if there is a difference in those kinds of cases, they are such a very small fraction of the types of cases that come before a court, I think the general consensus is that we can't say decisions are necessarily different because we bring diversity to the bench. But I come back to the fact that everyone, I think, agrees that for the judiciary and the justice system to be accepted in the future, it must reflect the face of our society. And if it does not, there will be segments of our society that increasingly distrust it. And there will be segments of our society that, that it leads to difficulty and dissension because of it. And so I think all of us, as citizens of this country, have an obligation to work to see that our judiciary is as diverse as possible. So to go back to that first question, and where are we, and does our diversity reflect the population? I'm happy to report that the numbers I'm going to give you are going to change within weeks. <laughs> But to give you a snapshot right now, 19 of 166 judges of the district court are women. That's 11.4% of the, of the judges in the district judges in the state of Kansas, and that is 50% uh, if you look at the population. So we're doing fairly well there. As you look at African Americans, we only have 1.8% of, of the judges as compared to 6.2% of the population. Latino or Hispanic, only 2.4% as judges, 9.1% as a percentage of the population. And Asian judges, 0.6% of our judges, as compared to the population of Kansas of 2.2%. So the, the numbers lag. We have work to do. And to talk about that, I want to give you the quickest overview of the judicial selection system in the state of Kansas that I can give you. This is the Reader's Digest version to cram it into the, the time we have. But before the panelists talk, I think it's important that you have some sense of that. As you, most of you know, Kansas' historical origins is that we were, are a populist state. And so, in the uh, Constitution of Kansas, as it started, we elected everybody, including the people that were the groundskeeper for the capital, the state printer, anybody that had a job was elected by the people. And that, of course, included the judges of Kansas. That remained true until the late 1959. And to set the historical tone at that time, across the country there was a move afront to change from election of judges of state court judges 
to either something more like what the federal judges did or a concept that was often known as the Missouri Plan, which is a, a merit selection plan. And the concept of the Missouri Plan is that those who are qualified, that meet statutory qualifications, are eligible to submit a nomination to a screening panel. That screening panel reviews those people and then selects two or three to give to the appointing authority in Kansas that eventually became the governor. The governor would then make the appointment and that person becomes the judge. As there was discussion of that across the country, it hadn't, that discussion hadn't really taken, uh, had any traction in the state of Kansas until the election, the primary election season of 1959. At that point, the then sitting governor lost in the primary. He was a Republican. Um, it was Governor Hall, for those of you that may remember the situation. He, the person who beat him in the primary, then lost in the general election to Governor, to be Governor Docking. So Governor Hall, as a lame duck governor, um, as they approach the end of the time, it, we're, we're in the late December at this point in time, his friend, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Kansas Supreme Court, is very ill and is going to be facing certain retirement. He is a supporter of Hall and is not a supporter of docking. And so he resigns from his office as Supreme Court Justice. Well, I'm sorry, I've got, it, I've got the sequence out of place. The first step is that Governor Hall resigns and the Lieutenant Governor automatically t moves into the position as Governor. Then the Chief Justice resigns from the Supreme Court leaving that position open, and under that system, the governor made the appointment. And so the now, the new governor that had just a few days before been lieutenant governor, appoints his friend, the former governor, to the Kansas Supreme Court. That action, which became known in Kansas history as the triple play, um, <laughs> offended Kansans. And from that point forward, there was traction for the idea of moving to a system that would hopefully depoliticize the selection of judges and cause it to be based upon a merit selection. Uh, eventually, this led to a constitutional amendment, and that system of merit selection, as I said, was adopted statewide for appellate judges. So judges on my court of the Supreme Court or judges of the Court of Appeals go through that merit selection process where they are, make the application, a group, a nominating commission, um, then does extensive checks. You submit writing samples, uh, they now require credit reports, all sorts of things. They do background checks, they check out all of that and do a thorough screening. And then they select two or three names to go to the governor. That selection process is repeated at the governor's office. KBI does checks, all of those things happen and then the governor makes the appointment. We are then on the ballot at the next general election for all of you as voters to say, yes, this person should be retained in office, or no, this person should not. The system at, the, at your local level is much more difficult to describe because part of the political package for this to go through was that they allowed all judicial districts to make the decision of whether they wanted to stay with electing judges or they wanted to go to the merit selection. And so that issue was brought to the voters across the state and they were allowed to make their decision of which form they wanted to do. And in Kansas, I can give you the numbers um, if anyone is more interested, but let me just give you the generality that we are really pretty evenly split in terms of the number of judges that are elected versus appointed and the number of districts that do that. Um, there's, there, it's not exactly even, but we're just kind of in that middle range ballpark. In general, the western Kansas um, communities elect their judges, and then two urban areas, said Wichita, Sedgwick County, and Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas do. M Reno County's Hutchison does as well. Most of the other larger population areas are under a merit selection system. And so we see a diversity. 
Um, my time runs short, so I'm not going to tell, talk, I can talk about that in more detail in terms of, and I know there's a study being done now in terms of trying to determine which, which has resulted in more diversity. But the bottom line is we're not there. We have a ways to go. And it is important to the future of the Kansas judicial system and to all of us as citizens that depend upon a functioning system that is trusted as the guardian of the rule of law in Kansas, that we have a system that reflects the face of our communities and that is diverse and that presents a challenge to each of us to move forward to work for a system that accomplishes those goals. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Lukert. That was very illuminating. And uh, now I am pleased to introduce the moderator for our panel this evening, Professor David Proctor, and he is the director of the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democ Democracy. Professor. Thank you. Um, my name is David Proctor. I am the director of the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy here at Kansas State University. This institute was created and funded by Kansas State in 2004, and we are committed to improving public deliberation by engaging in scholarship, education, facilitation, and outreach. We are guided by both research and best practices in deliberation, and our mission is to improve public decision making on salient issues through informed, engaged, and civil deliberation. Our model of social and political discussion stresses inclusiveness, respect, and issue focus, and a search for understanding and common ground. And so I was very pleased when the League of Women Voters asked us to be a part of this uh, very important forum where we're discussing the critical issue, advancing judicial diversity. Before I turn it over to the panelists, I just want to uh, let you know the process that will follow. Uh, we've asked each of the panelists to speak for approximately eight minutes. And uh, just to let the panelists know, we have our uh, timekeepers down in front. And so uh, they have uh, uh, time cards that'll give you an indication as to where you are at, or you're at in time, uh, time wise. I would also um, uh, remind everyone that uh, we are very interested in uh, taking questions, following the presentations. You should have all received cards when you came in. Uh, we would like for you, if you're interested, to uh, write your question on those cards. Then we will, uh, they'll, they'll bring those cards forward and, and we'll offer those questions to uh, the panelists. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, now turn it to the, uh, to the panelists. I would invite you all to uh, take a look at the program that you uh, received when you came in. On the back side of the agenda is uh, a biography for each of our panel speakers tonight. And so I'm not going to uh, read their biography, but would invite you to uh, uh, take a look at those uh, credentials uh, of, of each of our panelists. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, uh, turn it over to our first panelist, the Honorable Richard Green. Uh, who was uh, appointed to the Kansas Court of Appeals in 2003. Thank you very much, David. If you just gaze at our panel of judges this evening, you can see that I represent the problem here <laughs> as the um, white Anglo-Saxon male. Um, I am one of the 80% of your Kansas judges. Um, as Justice Luker told you, we have a long way to go. Uh, having said that, I want you to know that uh, this discussion is not threatening to me. In fact, um, uh, this is a, um, judicial diversity is a goal that I very much subscribe to, and I hope uh, by the time we finish tonight, you'll understand that it's important to all of us. Uh, I would like to, um, 
just jump to what I think are three or four things that, that we can all do as citizens to begin to promote judicial diversity and do a little better job in Kansas than we're currently doing. I think number one, um, as Justice Lukert indicated, at the appellate level, we have the, we call it the merit appointive system for judges, but at the district level, we're about 50-50 in our counties between elected, partisan elected judges and the merit appointive system. Um, I think particularly at the appellate system, one thing that we can do is, is to continue to embrace and promote and maintain our merit appointive system. And the reason that I say that, um, I think that some of the studies that I have found indicate that it's difficult to tell which system best leads to diversity. But one thing we know is that with the merit appointive system, we can, in fact, direct, as a people, our nominating commissions to take into consideration judicial diversity when they make their nominations. And, and, and that leads me to my second suggestion, which is in, in effect a legislative change, if you will. We have at two places in our Kansas statutes a statute that says specifically how these merit appointee systems should work at the appellate level and at the district court level. And I would suggest that we take a page from, I happen to be from Missouri, from Missouri, which currently has the best, now they're not there yet, but they have the best judicial diversity of any state in our nation. And one reason that I think perhaps they do is that their rules provide, and I just want to quote this, uh, that the nominating commission shall actively seek out and encourage qualified individuals, including women and minorities, to apply for judicial office. And that the commission shall further take into consideration the desirability of the bench reflecting the racial and gender composition of the community. We have no such direction to our nominating commissions at this time in Kansas. I would suggest to you that there are two statutes that could easily be amended by our legislature, and of course, that could start with us, and I know the League of Women Voters certainly uh, has a lot of influence with our legislature, to add into our nominating procedures similar type of mandates to our nominating commissions, both at the appellate level and at the district court level that indeed they shall seek out and encourage qualified individuals, including women and minorities, and that secondly, they will take into consideration the desirability of the bench looking like the community that it will serve. Um, so that's, that's sort of my, uh, my second idea. Thirdly, um, I, I find that we do have on the books under our nominating commission statute particularly at the appellate level, um, some language that is not practiced currently, and we need to encourage our commissions to practice this. This is what our statute actually says, and it will come as a surprise, perhaps, to some of you who are even familiar with our commissions. The commission shall take, this is in Kansas law now, the commission shall take cognizance of the fact that the best qualified nominees may be those whom it would be most difficult to persuade to serve. Accordingly, the commission shall not limit its consideration to persons who have been suggested by others or to persons who have indicated their willingness to serve. The commission may, if it sees fit to do so, tender nominations to one or more qualified persons prior to and subject to the formal action of the commission in making its nominations in order to ascertain whether such person will agree to serve if nominated. What does all that mean? Well, currently, our commissions uh, use an application process. If you are qualified for a judicial position, you can submit it at a, a nomination form to the nominating commission. But I'm suggesting that the language in the current law would permit our commissions to, in fact, do some recruitment. And in fact, if they have a lily-white group, a lily-white male group of nominees, that they get busy and recruit some women and minorities to add to that group before they go into their nominating process. That's already on the books and it's not practiced. Um, and, uh, fourth, uh, I think it's very important that we keep, this is, uh, this is called the pipeline argument in the literature. 
We have to keep the pipeline full of good women and minority lawyers. And that means we keep the pipeline full of good women and minority law students. And the first step in that is to continue to promote scholarships to women and minorities for law school. And I think that's, um, we already do that to some extent, but we could do a better job. And then finally, um, I would suggest that we elect governors who have the power in the end to make the final selection from the nominating process. We need to elect governors who are committed to a diverse judiciary. Um, we've had some, we've had others who didn't want to make that a priority, but I think as citizens it's something we can do uh, to ask those who would serve as our governor whether they are committed to that as a priority and indeed to put our weight and our votes behind those who will agree that judicial diversity is important to Kansas. And so those are just a few ideas um, that I have, and uh, without using any more time, um, I'm going to pass this on to uh, one of my colleagues. I'll just give you this um, little conclusion. This is actually, I'm going to quote for you just a couple sentences from the conclusion of the Brennan Center study on racial diversity. Uh, it's a very excellent study for those of you who are interested in digging into this subject deeper. Uh, but its conclusion is that attaining a diverse bench across the nation is paramount to maintaining the legitimacy and the success of our state courts. Therefore, states must make judicial diversity a core policy priority. Fostering judicial diversity requires an affirmative commitment by all involved, including politicians commissions, applicants, and the bar. So I leave you with those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Green. Um, our second speaker, who has uh, sat on the Kansas Court of Appeals since 1993, is the Honorable Henry Green. Thank you. Good evening. I just have a, a few brief comments. It brings back um, when I, I became a judge on the Kansas Court of Bills. Uh, I remember uh, Governor Finney, as she appointed me to this position, and I remember uh, meeting her in her office. She was interviewing uh, the, the people who had been nominated uh, for a position uh, to fill, I think it was Bob Davis' position, position number seven. And uh, she had on her desk, and, and she uh, addressed me and said, Henry, you know, you know what I have here on my desk? I, I have a request of this particular uh, defendant who won his sentence uh, community, and do you know he's black? And uh, let me tell you briefly uh, what happened here. Uh, he was uh, out in extreme western Kansas. Uh, he was stopped. Uh, they found a marijuana uh, in his possession. He was charged with uh, marijuana and uh, possession of marijuana, and he was sentenced, and he received a 10-year sentence. And uh, he is asking that his sentence be commuted because if he had been white, uh, probably his sentence would not have been any more than six months. And this was during a time when uh, uh, the legislature uh, uh, w was talking about changing uh, intermediate sentencing, giving a lot of discretion to the trial court judges as far as in, in their sentencing matters to uh, going to the guideline sentencing, uh, restricting uh, uh, you know, as far as certain uh, sentence and you know, your prior criminal history, what kind of sentence that you can get. And she said, you know, I wouldn't have a problem if this was like the only case that I was getting, but she said, I'm getting more and more of these cases where minorities are being sentenced uh, disproportionately harder uh, for uh, crimes that I, I don't look at being that severe or being uh, punished more uh, severely than their white counterparts are. And then she said, I am really in favor of, of, of the sentencing uh, uh, guidelines uh, and uh, which we do operate under the sentencing guidelines uh, now. As far as the diversity, I think it's been my experience on the court that diversity may have, uh, have more effect on my colleagues than me that as far as some of the cases that, that have come before uh, uh, our, our court, and especially cases that, that involve uh, uh, racial issues. 
Uh, for example, uh, the, I have an office that is completely diversified. Uh, my judicial assistant, every uh, uh, judge has a uh, judicial assistant. Uh, she is a Hispanic female. Uh, every office, uh, a judge has a right to have a research attorney, and my research attorney is a white female. And uh, we have a completely diversified office, and it works really well. And one of the reasons why I think the diversity, as far as uh, what I've seen, and maybe has affected my colleagues uh, more than uh, I, it has affected me, is a couple of cases I remember uh, having that I want to share with you. It was one case that uh, involved the sentencing of a a black offender who was asking that he would uh, re receive a modification of his sentence. And I quote from the transcript, and this is what the trial court judge said. But we are dealing with a black man, and unfortunately he is probably in a position to have periods where he might be humiliated or disrespected. And if he is violent during those periods, he is just as a high risk to this community. This is what a trial court judge said. What kind of disturbed me when we got this case, uh, whether or not uh, this was okay and, and, and the trial court didn't uh, modify his sentence, um, the panel that I was on, I wasn't assigned to Arthur, this particular judge, but the, the judge who was assigned to Arthur, this particular opinion, uh, was white. Uh, he knew uh, this trial court judge who made the statement and he was put in a comfortable position because he was uh, reluctant to reverse because he was saying this judge may feel that I uh, think that he is biased. And I was really taken back by that because it's not the question what maybe this trial court judge might think that you're biased, but was this fair uh, to this particular uh, uh, defendant to say because he is black He's in a community that may would humiliate him, and therefore I cannot modify your sentence because I don't think you're going to control uh, maybe your emotions or, or, or so forth. But make a long story short, we, we discussed this, we talked this out, and um, my colleague and, and the panel agreed that this case needed to go back and to a different judge uh, for a consideration of, of this issue. There's other cases I don't want to bore you with, but th these are uh, type of cases that can come up and that if you have a, a diverse court, uh, that some of these things can be talked about and worked out uh, where uh, uh, maybe they would not have been worked out uh, in the past. I th why diversity works well uh, is because the different life experiences uh, that is brought uh, uh, to a court. Uh, for example, my life experiences and, and things that I've dealt with it, it is much different, a, a lot different from Richard and things that, that may have happened. And now we don't supposed to make our decisions based on life experiences, but those life experiences are really important. Uh, for example, when we have a case that maybe a statute doesn't cover. Uh, and first of all, we generally go and look and see if there's a statute that will cover this particular issue. If a statute doesn't cover this particular, uh, particular issue, then we look at case law. And what we mean is cases that have been decided, for example, our Supreme Court, and saying like when you have these particular fact situations, this is the way this case should be decided. Well, if we don't have a statute, and if we don't have a case uh, that has decided this particular issue, this is when it becomes really hard uh, for judges because then we get in a situation where we may have to create a new rule. And you don't want to create a new rule without looking and see whether or not it, how it's going to affect uh, other people, the society, how it's going to affect the public and things of this nature. And this is where the life experiences uh, come to bear. If you have a court that has different life experiences, then you get a, a better and bigger picture of what the problem that you might be dealing with at the particular time. So life experiences are very helpful uh, uh, for our court. And, and, and as 
diversity plays into that if you have a diverse court uh, because you protect yourself of having a court of uh, a total like mine. Uh, thank you. Judge Green, thank you so much. Um, our third panelist is the most uh, uh, recent appointee of our panelists tonight to the Kansas Court of Appeals. Uh, we're pleased to have with us the Honorable Melissa Taylor Standridge appointed to the Court of Appeals in 2008. Thank you. Normally I don't even need one of these. My kids would tell you that. Um, I have a lot to say, so I'm going to talk kind of fast, which is my nature anyway. But uh, I have a couple points to make. The first one being what Justice Luker talked about is uh, the appearance for everyone, every litigant, to feel like that the courts are fair and impartial. That's extremely important. But diversifying the courts, it's not just an appearance, as Judge Green was saying, that the perspective of the judges on the courts uh, can, you know, truly make a difference. And based on, based on life experiences, for example, number one, um, I was a fo am a foster mom, uh, and I have adopted four of my foster kids and have been deeply entrenched in the foster care system for over a decade. And so my perspective on, you know, children in need of care is going to be completely different from someone who doesn't have that. Um, Two of my children are black, two of them are Hispanic, and two of them are white. Um, just based on life experiences, we live kind of smack in the middle of Leewood, Kansas, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, so we, we, do, we are the diversity in Leewood. <laughs> um, my kids were going to summer camp, and we took the same way to summer camp every day for a summer. And uh, in the first week or two, we're driving along, and there is a police officer, and I was going, I'm going to admit this on the videotape, <laughs> about 42, maybe, in a 35. And the cop unrolled his window and said, you know, slow it down, slow it down. You know, so I waved, and I go, woo, you guys, that was a close one. You know, a week later, we drive by, and, and the police officer there, and he had a black uh, young man stopped giving him his ticket. And so Clint, my 12-year-old black son, said, well, Mama, do you think that he also got a warning too? You know, what are you going to say to your kid in the middle of Leewood? I don't know. Maybe he did get a warning too. But those are the kinds of things that are my life experiences based on my children and the things that they see and experience in their life. So I come to the bench, you know, from a completely different perspective. Um, I have a one-year-old child. And uh, the, the other judges on, on the court, um, you know, they, they gave... My, my new son, Quentin, uh, books. And when they were giving them to me, they said, you know, we've never had a judge, you know, on our court have a, have a new child. Most people on the court, their children are either teenagers or are in college. You know, I have a one-year-old. Um, I also have three middle schoolers. Uh, so that brings a, a totally different perspective to the court as well. Um, and just expanding on what Judge Green said, that, that we all grow up, you know, we played different games when we were kids. We had different vacations. Um, some kids never had a vacation growing up. Uh, the schools that we went to, the teachers we had, the mentors we had, whether we had two parents or one parent or a grandmother, uh, these are all things that, that change your perspective on life. Okay, so that's why it's important. It, it critical. It's critical in reality, not just in appearance. So how can we fix it? And I've been trying to not fix particularly diversity on the bench, but diversity in the legal profession now for about 15 years. Um, I practiced with a large law firm and was uh, the person that, at, that started a diversity committee in recruiting. Um, we had 200 lawyers, and out of the 200 lawyers, we had two of color, 
one Latino, one black lawyer out of 200. Um, and I won't even go into the, the gender difference, but we started that year uh, recruiting at minority job fairs, making sure that our firm was somewhere where a person of color would feel comfortable, making sure that we got together with other uh, minority groups in the city so that our people would think, oh, well, I could come to Kansas City and live and find someone that looks like me to marry and have kids and settle down. Uh, those are all the things that, that came into play. Um, so that's just kind of a, a, a background. When I um, was on the Kansas Bar Association and Justice Lukert was the president, I was on the Board of Governors, uh, we started a, um, we had just started a diversity committee, and I started a legal internship program for people, students, high school students of color in Kansas City, Kansas. Again, you know, based on, you know, I, I didn't really know a lawyer when I went to law school, but a lot of these kids, you know, maybe they want to be a lawyer, but they don't know a lawyer. They don't know a judge. You know, I mean, it's um, their bring your daughter to work day is maybe at a restaurant. You know, you, you know so, the, so bringing these kids in, showing them what a professional environment is like, um, buying them uh, navy blazers and khaki pants to wear to work every day, paying them seven fifty an hour, um, and, and then they can network and meet people. And, you know, and, and actually that is really, you know, my next point is how do we increase the diversity on the benches, we have to go way, way back. And I'm, you know, maybe grade school, but let's talk about junior highs and high schools. That's where we need to start. This is a long-term uh, uh, goal, and as Justice Green said, we're talking about a pipeline. And that's where we need to start. And every one of you in this room can be part of that because we can go to the high schools and we can mentor these kids and encourage these kids to pursue careers in the law um, and, and show them what that's like. Um, all right, so if we do that, if we, if we start this pipeline, what we can do is expand the pool of applicants that are applying to law schools. And Professor Valdez will talk about that more in a minute. But right now, we don't have very many people of color applying at law schools. We're good, and she'll probably give you the statistics later, but we're good, I think, more women than men are enrolled in law school. But you look at those diversity numbers, and you know, um, African Americans are 13% of the population, and at the average in a law school is maybe, you know, you're maybe gonna have five kids of color in a, in a, uh, a first year class, five out of 200. You know, and so we need to recruit these people, and as Judge Green said, you know, that's giving scholarships, but also it, it doesn't have to do just with scholarships. It has to do with, you know, these kids, they may be interested in it, but they don't know anybody. They, you know, they come from different environments, different backgrounds, and um, maybe even their parents are chemical engineers. I'm not saying that, you know, my, people of color or minorities come from a lower socioeconomic class. I'm just saying that we need to do a better job of recruiting and encouraging uh, kids of color to go to law school. Um, if we encourage them to go to law school, then more will graduate from law school and more will practice law in Kansas. Right now, uh, as I said, I was on the Board of Governors, we have tried for two years in a row to just try to guesstimate even through surveys to figure out how many lawyers of color that we have in the state of Kansas. Uh, there are 9,000 lawyers in Kansas. 7,000 of them are members of the Kansas Bar Association. But I, you know, I mean, we tried to make an ad hoc list and it's, it's less than 100. 100 out of 9,000. Okay, so we, so are we surprised that we don't have any candidates uh, for the bench that are of color when we have 100 out of 9,000 attorneys in the state of Kansas? So that's what I'm talking about. We gotta, we gotta go back. We gotta go way back. Um, I see I only have one minute left and I was trying to get the Greens to give me their time, <laughs> but they wouldn't do that. <laughs> So with this program that I started through the KBA, my first high school student of color uh, will graduate law school this May. And um, so, so this, th we can do this, we can do this. Justice Lukert, uh, one of her mentors, is graduating law school this May or next May? Oh, last May, sorry. Uh, okay, so here's just two examples of grassroots where we actually can go out and do that. Um, 
And, and then finally, the final thing is, is mentoring is so important. And I've been a mentor to probably over 50 uh, students that have been through the law school process. When I was here last year, I handed out my cards um, and I had somebody shadow me for a day. She started at KU two weeks ago. Um, I'm gonna, after this, I'm gonna hand out my cards. I brought like 40 cards. And if you're interested in pursuing a career in the law, I want you to talk to me. I will be your mentor because there's so much involved in the whole process that I can help you with, that Judge Green can help you with, Judge Greeny. And just because you're of color doesn't mean you have to have, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's what we call him in the court. Just because you're a student of color doesn't mean that you have to have a mentor of color. It's kind of, you know, it, it's okay to have a mentor that's not of color. I only got through a fourth of this, so I, I'm done, but I'll be out there with my business cards. Thank you, Judge Standridge. Uh, we are uh, um, very pleased to have our uh, final speaker with us here tonight. Uh, professor Suzanne Valdez, who is the Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Kansas School of Law. Thank you. I also have a booming voice, so I'm not sure if I'm going to need this microphone either. Um, I've been teaching at KU now for 10 years, and one of my mentors um, at the law school who I uh, look up to in terms of his teaching and what he does in the classroom, I asked him when I started teaching, how are you so effective? And he said, Suzanne, this is what you do. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So that's exactly what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to, um, I want to talk about three different areas. I want to talk about um, sort of my thought on gender diversity, um, uh, talk also or discuss racial and ethnic diversity. I think those are really two separate sort of um, categories um, for some reasons that I'll, that I'll explain. Um, and then lastly, what I want to do is um, give you my thoughts um, mostly as they relate to law schools and law students. And I think Judge Standridge has um, highlighted a lot of the, the key points of what I want to talk about. Um, but I'll just give you my perspective as a, um, a teacher of the law. I feel very privileged to be able to be a teacher of the law, to teach students and to um, have new law students come every year uh, to the law school. And I'm always very, very uh, concerned. Um, I always have wide eyes when it comes to seeing the makeup of our class. Um, as Judge Standridge has said, we're not going to have judges, we're not going to have lawyers unless we have law students uh, who represent gender diversity and who represent uh, racial and ethnic diversity. So briefly, concerning uh, gender diversity, there's some national statistics that were recently published by the American Bar Association. Uh, the, law, the law journal that lawyers get um, in July of 2010, so this is fairly recent information. Uh, and you'll be glad to know that 20 states have women serving as chief justice of their Supreme Courts. That, that number was surprising to me and I was absolutely quite pleased. Uh, this is more than any time in the U.S. in the history of the United States. Approximately 26 percent of state judges, uh, presumably this number includes both trial judges and appellate judges, um, uh, compose the state, judici state judiciary uh, systems throughout the country. And then of the federal judiciary, 22% are women. So we are, we are getting up there, and I think the point of this particular article was that um, gender diversity is clearly on the rise, uh, especially on the bench. That same article provides that 48% of uh, law students matriculating are women. That's a great number. Um, I'm soon going to share with you that the number in Kansas, at least at the KU Law School, isn't quite that, unfortunately. 45% um, of law firm associates are women. So women definitely are going to law school um, and they're graduating. And I will tell you that probably in the last five or six years, the number one student graduating, number one ranked student graduating from the KU Law School has been a female. So um, they're doing well in law school as well. The Kansas judiciary, um, we've had some various numbers thrown out here, both by Justice Lukert and Judge Green and Judge Standridge. Um, I'm very proud in Douglas County, where I live in Lawrence, um, four of the six district judges are women. So we make up the majority of the trial level judges in Lawrence, um, which I think is applaudable. In terms of um, gender statistics for law students, um, unfortunately, KU 
does not uh, match the national average of 48 percent. Um, just to give you an example, in 2008, there were 40 percent women in the first year class, 2009, 40 percent. This year, I'm quite disappointed, 36 percent are women. Our best year was in 2004, where we had 47 percent. Um, and I can tell you, just walking through the halls and going to class, I could see it. It was visible. We had a lot more women in the building. Um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about that, and of course, we'll make an effort to recruit women. So I will be handing out my business cards as well, um, if you're interested in going to law school. Um, so there are efforts, I think, it, with regard to gender diversity that, is, that has gotten a lot better. Um, hopefully that will continue to grow, and in Kansas that will um, continue to grow as well. Racial and ethnic diversity is a little different. Um, in terms of matriculation in law school, 21% at the KU Law School in 2008, um, and then we went down to 17% and then to 16% this year. Um, and so when you look at our demographics um, in the state of Kansas, arguably at least our admissions director says we're in line with the racial demographics, although um, I have yet uh, to, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to try to disprove that because I think we can do a lot better. Um, my thoughts concerning the, my third point, um, my thoughts concerning um, law schools and law students um, and, and getting good people, good diverse people to go to law school, I want to share with you just an anecdote that happened 15 years ago. I'm not a native Kansan, I grew up in Arizona, my dad's a copper miner, um, my mom worked an office job, I have a lot of family in Southern California and a, a lot of extended family who are, um, uh, involved in gangs and lived in, in the hood in uh, South Central Los Angeles. And about 15 years ago, I was a law student and I went to California and um, to visit some family. And one of my cousins, and I have millions of them, like most Hispanic um, Hispanics do, says, I want, let's go to this party over in South Central Los Angeles. And immediately I'm thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to be safe? You know, I, I, I'd been living in Kansas for a while and so I was kind of a little unnerved by the whole. Uh, idea of doing this, but I went to this big, huge party uh, with people that I knew, a lot of people I didn't know, and I happened upon a conversation where apparently um, this gentleman had been convicted in California of a pretty serious crime. Um, I think it was mostly drug related, but he, his case goes up to the California Court of Appeals, and so what we have in this discussion is mostly all Hispanics or all Latinos talking about this particular defendant. And they were talking about his appeal. And the question, and so I'm standing there, they know I'm a law student, and so I'm kind of listening, not really saying anything because I really don't know these people very well. But one gentleman says, Well, did they uphold his conviction? And this other gentleman says, Well, yes, he, his conviction was upheld. The next question was, Well, who were the judges? And, um, one of the gentlemen says, well, actually there was a Latino that was on the, the, the panel. And there were probably four or five people standing around there and they said, oh, okay, well then, we'll accept that. And so my point is that by having a diverse bench, I believe these people um, were much more accepting of this particular person's situation. And so that's just sort of my sort of my anecdotal, you know, my example of why it's important to have diversity on the bench. Because I think that it really um, enforces the legitimacy of lawyers, it enforces the legitimacy of the legal system, um, and, um, and again, it's important. So in terms of what we can do as a law school, um, I think recruitment of minority applicants is very important. A lot of Hispanics, a lot of blacks don't think they can do it. You know why? Because they don't have role models, all right? And I can't tell you the number of students that have come to my office and say, I've got a 4.0 at KU. I did this on my LSAT. And I said, why aren't you going to law school? Well, I don't think I can do it. Who told you you can't do it? Okay? And they come from backgrounds where maybe their parents aren't educated, or they, you know, again, just a different sort of um, upbringing. And so it's very important to encourage applicants because these people are smart and they can contribute positively to both the education um, at the law school as well as to the profession.
Um, I also want to say that uh, in terms of students wanting to become judges, I mean, I think as these um, three judges here at, at the table will say, you know, it's, it's a goal, but there's lots that goes on between starting law school and ultimately being on the bench that you have to focus on. You gotta get good grades. You know, you gotta, you gotta be a good lawyer. You've got to do, you know, lots of different things. The stars have to align. Um, and so, anyway, and, and, you know, be involved in, in service, both to your community and to your, to your profession. Those are things that are very important for judges. And so, um, those are the kind of discussions that I have with, um, with students. As a law school, we can continue to have, okay, I'm sorry, again, I have, pages, so I will stop. Um, but there's lots that we can do. I do have business cards too, and if there's anyone interested in going to law school, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you. Well, thank you to uh, all of the panelists and uh, Justice Lukert for your keynote address. I have seen some folks with uh, questions, and so if you want to bring those up, I would be glad to, uh, to uh, ask some of the questions. Uh, this uh, says this is to Judge Green, so I'll let either Judge Green uh, <laughs> answer this. Uh, the, the question is, um, uh, I think the question says currently a voter can, cannot nominate an attorney they feel would be a good judge. I guess the question is, is that accurate? Is that an accurate statement or not? Can you say that again? Uh, is it possible for a voter to uh, nominate uh, a, an attorney they feel would be a, a good judge? Is that, a, is that a pathway to nomination? I think at the district level you can uh, uh, nominate. Um, yeah, if you're a voter. So, so maybe the broader question is, as citizens of Manhattan, uh, uh, voters in Riley County, if, if we believe that we know a, an attorney that we think would be a, um, a, a good judge, that is within our capacity to nominate that person. Because yeah, but, but you know, you really need to get with that person because you got to fill out an application and, 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 and so forth. So. And certainly the person you nominate has to be on board. And I think Richard uh, indicated that, uh, Judge Green, uh, uh, when he was uh, speaking. Um, uh, so I, I just think you can throw the name in and then that, that, that's all uh, what happened. I think the person is going to have to uh, fill out an application sure. and so forth. Because Riley County is based on the merit selection system, just having a name before the commission is not going to enable the commission to be able to determine whether that is one of the three people that have the most merit. So there is an extensive application process, so you could um, nominate the person while at the same time going to the person to have them fill out the application with all the background information necessary to be able to demonstrate the merit. So you well, couldn't just the nominate. Other, the other twist on that, the, when the, there is an opening, there will be uh, public notices, and the names of the commissioners will be listed in that, and members of the public are invited to contact those commissioners with any thoughts, concerns, input. And that will happen um, both at the nomination stage and then when, uh, when it's announced that the interviews will occur, and those are open to the public. And if a name would come forward to the commission, as uh, Judge Green indicated, our statute allows the commission to make contact with an individual. Right. So the, the suggestion was that 
that person should be in touch with the attorney. If they're not comfortable with that, it can also work through that name being given to the commission, and then a commissioner can make that contact and encourage that person to apply. I served on the 7th Judicial District Commission years ago, and that exa that's exactly what happened. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I served on the 7th Judicial District in Douglas County um, for a four-year term, and we had a vacancy, and that's exactly what happened. We had. Um, someone call me saying, um, I really want to nominate this particular lawyer. Um, and so I said, okay. So I, I actually called the lawyer and I said, are you going to be applying? And the lawyer was very surprised and said, well, no. And I said, well, someone called and recommended you uh, as being someone who should apply. Oh, well, I'm honored, but I am not interested. Thank you very much. I mean, that was unfortunate, but that was the process. I mean, we, we got the call for someone who had made the nomination, but that particular person has to be on board and fill out the, doc the paperwork, and it's extensive, um, to be considered. The, the, uh, the next question, uh, this, this questioner writes, diversity and affirmative action are related but different concepts. Should uh, the principle of affirmative action be applied to judicial selection? Well, I proposed in my remarks a change to the Kansas statute, which would, in fact, encourage our judicial nominating commissions to take this into consideration. Um, I don't know whether you call that affirmative action per se, but that's one step toward affirmative action that it seems to me makes pretty good sense, and that would require legislative change. This questioner uh, writes, um, uh, what impact do uh, groups with uh, political agendas, uh, political right, political left, have on the diversity of the judiciary? And are you seeing more of that politi politization of the uh, nominations to the bench? And I think that's, that's kind of why the merit selection system um, was created to kind of, you know, you've got a group of individuals. Um, I'll just point to, to Johnson County has 14. They have 14 lawyers and 14 non-lawyers on a commission uh, that interview, you know, the applicants and, and make a decision. And on in during the application process, whether it's for an appellate court judge position like I have or at the county level, they don't even know what party you are. It's not asked and, you know, you, it's really not part of the process about who the, the top three names would be. Generally, politicization of judicial offices is something to be avoided because generally what that leads to is that the interest groups involved are going to are going to promote what we call litmus tests for the bench. Do you believe so and so about this issue or that issue? Because that's most important to them as an attribute of a judge. It is, however, not necessarily among those criteria that ought to be at the top of the list as qualifications to sit on the bench. What I may think about a certain political issue is not nearly as important as the kind of things that the nominating commission would look at. My background, my experience, my education, my service to the bar, my practice, my clients, uh, my reputation, those are more important, I would suggest. So when, when we move toward any type of politicization, um, it's a problem. And we should try to avoid it. I think that. Um, Particularly, I can speak for our Supreme Court nominating commission, and I can say that um, politics does not play a role there. It should not play a role, and it has not played a role. Um, I was never asked for my political affiliation. It was never a question that was framed to me. I was never required to go into whether I was a member of a political party or what I believed about any political issue at any time in a very extensive vetting process. And that's the way I suggest it should stay.
one of the significant issues uh, facing Kansas State University, and I'm sure um, um, all of the universities in Kansas, colleges and universities, is um, what we call the uh, brain drain. Uh, students graduate from our university and they go to another state oftentimes to work. Uh, this questioner uh, says, um, Judge Standridge pointed out that there is an increase um, uh, in diversity in Kansas law schools. And this questioner asks, uh, is, is the issue of this brain drain uh, a problem in uh, efforts to diversify the, uh, the bench in Kansas? My answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, having, b we're so close in Kansas City, uh, you know, the, the border splits, uh, the Kansas-Missouri border, and Missouri, as Judge Green mentioned, uh, is extraordinarily diverse. They have a very strong uh, ethnic bar association, r uh, racial, and a lot of students that graduate from the University of Kansas are going over to Missouri to practice. And it, and it goes back to what I said before that, you know, when you look in Kansas, if you go to the grocery store, if you go to a restaurant where you go, you know, do you look around and see people that look like you? And if you don't, you don't want to live there. You don't, you know, how are you going to find a husband or a wife and have children or, you know, how are you going to find your hair products? You know, I mean, I live in Johnson County. I have to drive to Missouri to get hair products for my kids. I'm not kidding. You know, I mean, that is a perfect example. So yes, it's a, it's a huge issue. And until we can address that issue to make people of color feel comfortable living in our cities and in, in our environment and in our state, then yes, we could have huge populations, uh, huge uh, student graduates of color, and they'd all leave. That's my opinion. I, I just want to add that um, with Lawrence being diverse, I think it's probably the most diverse town or city in, in Kansas. Um, we've been uh, successful in, in, um, in recruiting students. I think the problem for KU is we need to have diverse faculty because the students are savvy. They want to come where there is a diverse faculty. Um, and we've had a hard time with that, going back to what Judge Standridge said. How do we bring qualified minority faculty to our law school? Recently, it's gotten better, because we've hired an African-American woman who's fabulous. We hired another woman. So, you know, for a while, we had no females. We had no people of color. It was, it was awful. Um, but, that, but students relate to that. Right? They want to know that there's a, a black man or a black woman or a Hispanic woman that they can go and talk to. And, they want, and that makes them feel welcomed. And so, I mean, there's so many areas here that we can, that we can work on to make this better. Um, an, another thing that uh, we see at Kansas State University is, is that uh, there are some students um, who are quite good at um, uh, positioning themselves for graduate school for employment based on their, their resumes, their vitas, their experiences. This question asks, um, do you believe that attorneys of color coming out of, uh, our attorneys of color, do you think that they have the same opportunities to uh, create the mes meritorious resume uh, as uh, 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 other students that would uh, enable them to uh, be uh, in a position to be selected to the bench. Okay. Uh, to answer your question, I, I think it's more difficult. Some of them don't have opportunity to uh, get some of the uh, internship programs. And what I mean is that I have colleagues or, and I, I know of judges uh, uh, who are white that have been able to get uh, their children in, in certain real good internship programs where it wouldn't be uh, uh, open, uh, you know, uh, necessary to a minority uh, if that minority didn't have connection. And those internship programs are, 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 are really are very helpful. They look great uh, on your resume, and it also gives you the experience 
uh, that uh, many times the employer is looking for uh, when he's about ready to hire, I mean, because he says, oh, wow, you already uh, got the necessary experience that we're looking for. Uh, if we hire you, you come in and, and you could just start right off where someone else who hasn't had uh, uh, some of those advantages and th things of this nature uh, wouldn't be up to speed. And, uh, and these firms, uh, especially in this uh, uh, type of economy, are looking uh, for uh, someone that can come in that has experience and, and ha has that resume that, that you're talking about. Thank you. Uh, this questioner asks uh, if any of you um, have any uh, practical suggestions or advice or, uh, as to how a non-diverse judge uh, can effectively address diversity-sensitive cases. I guess I'm the non-diverse judge. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I think Henry's right. I mean, we, uh, we consider ourselves brothers now, but, um, you know, we had very different uh, life experiences, no question about it, growing up. Um, I, I don't know exactly um, whether I bring to the bench any less sensitivity uh, with respect to um, a case where diversity might be some issue uh, th than a um, so-called diverse judge would, I would certainly try not to be any different. Um, you'd have to ask my colleagues, I guess, whether, whether they think I uh, um, am, am able to do that or whether I'm sort of bound by those uh, white male experiences, uh, but um, I, I, I certainly think that in my position, in attempting to do justice in every case, to listen carefully to both sides, to be fair and impartial at all times, and in dispensing the justice in writing an opinion, um, to essentially try to cut through and do what I think at the bottom line is right. Um, hopefully that's um, all that should be expected of me. Um, and uh, I don't know, you'd have to, you'd have to ask my, my colleagues candidly after the seminar whether they think I achieve it or not. <laughs> well, I, I, do, uh, I do want to point out we're going to ask a couple more questions uh, before 8.30, but um, I do want to point out that there is a reception after this is over. and. Just as Judge Green said, um, uh, if we don't get to your questions, um, we hope that you'll take that opportunity to, uh, to ask your question uh, personally of, uh, uh, of one of the judges before you. Um, th this is a question that, um, uh, that was presented to me, and, and, and this is what was written. Um, uh, what effect in the Federalist, is the Federalist Society having on appointments to the bench. Research shows they are causing the justice system to move to the right. So, um, and I guess the, the question, I, I would ask how you, you would respond to that, any of you? I'll, I'll respond to that because I have a little bit of uh, knowledge in terms of some of what's been going on, I think, that, that has led to this question. Um, at KU Law School, we have a professor who has worked with the Federal, Federalist Society to um, call into question the merit-based system and the structure of the, the Supreme Court Nominating Commission, which has caused sort of a, a, a big uproar, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this on video, but I will say, uh, uh, you know, um, People seek attention, whether it's good or bad. Um, as long as you're getting the attention, then um, you know, then 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 that's in their minds a good a good thing. But the Federalist Society has a lot of money. I mean, they have a lot of resources, and I think they are funding a lot of this, uh, unfortunately. 
Um, and, and many of you may be aware that, that the merit-based selection process and the Supreme Court Nominating Commission that appoints the Kansas Court of Appeals judges and the Supreme Court, there was a federal lawsuit that was filed um, with regard to the makeup of the commission. And thankfully, at this point, um, it's, it was filed in Wichita in the federal district court. Um, and right now, it's going uh, in terms of um, the process and where it is. There is a motion for a temporary restraining order to prevent the appointment of um, the um, replacement of former Chief Justice, um, a former Chief Justice who passed away. Um, and that has not, that was not halted. So thankfully, the process is going to go forward. And the argument is this for people who just in a very simple um, description, the, the argument is that there are five attorney members, there are four non-attorney members, and those attorney members that are, are make up part of that commission are elected by lawyers, by us. And so the argument is, is that it's, it's unconstitutional. Uh, but so far, the process has survived and it remains intact. But there are a lot of right-winged uh, groups, Federalist Society being one of those groups, who are interested in dismantling our process in Kansas. Okay, we'll finish with this question. Um, uh, we've talked uh, almost exclusively tonight about uh, gender and racial diversity. Uh, is there a concern um, regarding diversity in terms of gay and lesbian? Well, uh, sure, I, I think there is. And that's, um, you know, the, the issue becomes that under equal employment opportunity guidelines uh, right now, that that is not a protected class, okay? Sexual orientation is not a protected class. And so a lot of the laws against uh, discrimination don't include that as a protected class, so it's lagging a little bit behind. But I think when we're talking about diversity, one of the things we didn't talk about either was religion. You know, I, I don't know whether there ever has been a Jewish, uh, a Jewish court of appeals judge, but you know, I may be the first one. But, but that makes a difference too. We didn't talk about religion. But certainly, um, gays and lesbians, sexual orientation, uh, transgender, that whatever it is, that, that is included under the umbrella of the diversity scope as far as I'm concerned when I am talking about that issue. Great, uh, great, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, would you all join me again in thanking our panelists and Justice speaker. And what we would like to do now is to uh, ask our uh, four panelists and our keynote speaker uh, if you would uh, go ahead and, uh, and head toward, toward the foyer. We uh, want to make sure that uh, we uh, uh, get you into that space so that everybody has an opportunity to uh, talk with you and interact with you. And again, uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight and um, uh, appreciate your participation. Thank you so much.